Welcome all to the Adapting the Epic Model to Institutional Context webinar as a part of the 2020 Epic End free webinar series. I'm here today with Maria Domas from the University of St. Thomas, Minnesota. Uh, we're taping ahead of time due to a schedule change and we'll be doing a live discussion tomorrow with an audience uh, after viewing the recording. Before I begin, I want to take a moment and talk about Epic N, the, the organization that's putting on uh, the event today. The Epic Network stands for the Educational Partnerships for Innovation in Communities Network, or Epic N for short. It's the nonprofit association of higher education institutions that adopt the award-winning Epic model, which we'll be focusing on today during the call a lot. Uh, and they use that model to facilitate high impact, large scale university, local government, and community partnerships. Epic N supports autonomous university programs like the one we're gonna hear from today across the globe. And we help them connect their human capital and other university resources with their local cities, counties, community staff, uh, whatever they need to improve the quality of life for those all that are involved. All of Epic N's programming is presented by our member programs, the Ford Foundation and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Thank you to all those groups for their generous support. Today, I mentioned we're really focusing in on the five elements of the Epic model and how they could or could be or could not be adopted or adapted in your local context. These five key elements are, are used by all of our programs and we help all of our programs find out ways to uh, make them easier to apply, uh, overcome challenges. And again, we'll be talking about them more and we have some videos that are in the earlier in the schedule of the webinar series for you to look at if you'd like to learn more about the EPIC model itself. We also wanted to highlight the past, the, the oldie but goodie of our older version of the EPIC model, which originally had 12 tenets, and those include this list of things. And so Maria is gonna talk more about in the presentation, but for um, uh, understanding, we wanted to share this with you and also in the link and the details of the video, you'll find a link to a podcast that actually talks about these 12 tenants because they're also really helpful to understand why they were chosen and how they work um, before we revised it into just the five elements of the EPIC model. With that, I'm gonna introduce our speaker for today. Uh, she works at the University of St. Thomas. Her name is Mariah Thomas, and she is the director of the Sustainable Communities partnership. More about Maria can be found on our website in our new person profile, but I'll share with you shortly about some interesting things about her. Uh, she joined the work at the beginning in 2015 when they started the program. And in 2017, Maria created SCP Arts, which she'll talk about again. She received her PhD uh, in Environmental and Resources at the Environment and Resources at the University of Wisconsin. And another fun fact, uh, she likes scuba diving, which I will ask her about later. The program Maria operates, uh, you, again, started in 2015. Uh, they operate with an average of six partners a year, about 25 projects per year which usually means about 25 courses, but not always the case, uh, actual existing courses. And um, it's all done by Maria with a couple of helping hands um, from other folks that might come on, but for the most part, everything is done by her. We use this slide that I just talked through to help all of you understand the difference of positionality amongst all of our programs. Uh, I also need to, to make a correction. Uh, the location in the university is a sustainability center. I don't know if they do research, but Maria can help talk about that as we get into it. And speaking of getting into it, I'm going to hand it over to Maria now, and she will take us into the presentation so she can talk more about how a smaller liberal arts college adopted the EPIC model to their institutional context. Hi. 
My name is Maria Damas, the and I'm the director of the Sustainable Communities Partnership at the University of St. Thomas, as Marshall has said. SCP is a program within the Office of Sustainability Initiatives, which is a university-wide office that both um, creates opportunities for integration of sustainability across the curriculum, um, applied learning opportunities like the Sustainable Communities Partnership, and campus sustainability initiatives as well. Um, SCP is a member of the EPIC N network, and SCP, like other EPIC N programs, engages students across disciplines with local and regional government partners through course-based applied projects to advance community sustainability goals. Today, I'm going to discuss adapting the EPIC N model to institutional context, specifically through a case study of SCP's formation at a mission-driven liberal arts university in a large urban area. So first, I'll discuss mapping the landscape to understand the context of both the university and community and how the model could interact with it to add value to existing structures. Next, I'll briefly describe the pilot program and how it worked out, and then I'll discuss adaptations to the model informed by the context and by the pilot program um, based on both, again, the inst institutional structure of St. Thomas and the Twin Cities area in Minnesota, as I walk through this case study of program design decisions. And finally, I'll offer a few closing thoughts. So a key overarching question to ask, probably the first one to ask is, what is the landscape of your university? And by this, I mean, what are the core goals and priorities of your university? Where is the energy and momentum? And how can the EPIC N model advance these goals? Also, what existing structures could the EPIC N model leverage and enrich at your university to add value to what's there and to minimize the need for additional resources? Here is the example of this question at St. Thomas and how it worked out for us. St. Thomas is a mission-driven university, and in 2015, St. Thomas was in the midst of a strategic planning process. The strategic planning process was articulating the direction and energy of the university at that time. There were several strong connections between the strategic planning themes and the EPIC N model. Among them were, um, listed on the slide, multidisciplinary inquiry, applied learningship and partnership with the community, leveraging the urban location, the context of the community, and advancing the common good or having um, social good as a priority, as well as the university's commitment to integrating sustainability across the curriculum. Also at this time, City Labs, an EPIC and program run by a consortium of Twin Cities University in which St. Thomas faculty had participated had just closed. At St. Thomas, several of us who participated in City Labs as course instructors were very sad to see it go and were eager, very eager to determine if we could start a program at St. Thomas. And on top of that, EPIC N was holding their annual conference in Minneapolis. So this was, I admit, a unique alignment of events. And on top of that, just before the Epic N Conference in Minneapolis, the University of St. Thomas announced a call for internal grants to advance the strategic plan. Elise Amel asked me if I would like to write a proposal with her to launch an Epic N program at St. Thomas. I think that I replied yes with about 100 exclamation points. I was so excited. So the overarching guided question, guiding question as we wrote the proposal was, how can the EPIC model advance university strategic planning goals and leverage and add value to existing structures? The EPIC and tenants we emphasized in the proposal included a defined geographic focus and partnership timeframe, mutual investment and benefits to the partner and university, and the overarching goal of enriching learning in existing courses across disciplines through applied research and problem solving and advancing sustainability, the common good in the Twin Cities. The EPIC N model aligned with the broader goals of multidisciplinary and applied real world problem solving and integrating sustainability across disciplines and courses. SCP was a way to do this in an integrated um, holistic systems-based 
manner. The Epic N model provided a framework and track record of success that really helped our proposal. We received funding to launch a pilot program in August 2015. So the second question, so that's the landscape of your university. What is going on at that particular point in time and how can you leverage it um, to, so that the Epic N model can enrich the energy momentum direction and add value to those things? The second question that is very important to ask as well is the landscape of your community. Who are the potential partners? What would make a feasible and beneficial partnership for them? And what sustainability challenges are they facing that your university could address? This will inform the design of your program and enable it to add value to the entire landscape and of a systems-based perspective. For the Twin Cities region, this is what kind of the, for lack of a better word, the organizational context. It included, it includes large number a large number of small and medium-sized cities, agencies, and organizations in a metropolitan area, multiple liberal arts colleges, and a research university, and an existing Epic N program at the University of Minnesota where the Epic N conference was held, <laughs> which I mentioned before. And I just wanted to pause briefly to give a shout out to Mike Greco from the Resilient Communities Project, the Epic N program at the University of Minnesota for sharing so much um, advice and resources with us to help us get started. So my question was, returning to the question at hand, how could a program at St. Thomas fit into and add value to this existing landscape? So to answer this question, I talked with a lot of potential partners from different cities and agencies and nonprofits to understand their perspectives. This is what I learned. Partners, we're interested in these kinds of projects, exploratory projects that are important, like very important to them, but not urgent, like they need to be done tomorrow. They're very interested in projects that address goals on the back burner due to lack of staff time and funding to address them. And they were also, this is one thing that really surprised me, that they were interested in projects that are too small for typical research partnerships. So they were actually interested in really small projects and pieces of projects. Large-scale one-year partnerships were not feasible for the smaller cities that I talked with because of lack of capacity and time, but one to six projects per semester was feasible depending on the partner. Also, the multiple projects over time for a larger impact, a tenant of the Epic N model was very attractive to them. I can't emphasize enough how important this step was to understand the community and to understand for them your potential partners, what is feasible and beneficial and what will address the challenges they're facing. I don't think SCP would have been successful had these conversations not informed the design of the program. This helped me determine a gap that SCP could fill and add value to the whole organizational landscape. From these conversations, I proposed a multi-year overlapping partnership model. Also, this model aligned beautifully, I think, <laughs> with the university goals of integrating applied learning across the curriculum by, aging, by engaging more classes and more disciplines through smaller projects to reduce the barriers for classes to participate in even small projects that, that could then build on each other across semesters over multiple years. So we decided um, to partner with two cities and a watershed district for the pilot, which began in spring 2016. This multi-partnership model, again, adapted to the capacity of partners while still having a diversity of projects for courses at St. Thomas. And this pilot, just we were testing it out to see how it would work. Also, an important note, um, as a pilot funded by the internal grant, the partnership was free of charge, and this provided us with the luxury of flexibility for experimenting with different adaptations. So here, our projects from each partner for spring 2016, just to give you a sense of how it worked, how the, um, what kinds of projects each partner had. Uh, this is with this, these are with the city of Elk River and their population is about 25,000 people. These were, this was the project with two economics classes um, with the city of Delano, whose population is about 6,000 people. And then, um, 
these are the projects with the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, a government entity. So across the three partners, we had 13 projects for the first semester, 11 undergraduate and two graduate um, across nine different disciplines. So now I'll discuss in more detail the adaptations to the epic end model, things that the pilot semester um, informed as well, in addition to the conversations I had with potential partners and understanding the university context and structures as well. So the first um, adaptation is the multi-year overlapping partnerships. So these are, uh, this slide shows the benefits of the multi-year partnership model at St. Thomas. Um, with also the overlapping partnerships, so multiple partners at the same time. At St. Thomas and in our context, this enables progress at a pace to small cities and government agencies that is feasible for them, but with the same cumulative impact. It allows partners to align the number of projects with their variable capacity throughout the partnership timeframe. So if they're really busy with other work one semester and they can't, they can only do one project, maybe the next semester they would be like, they would like to um, collaborate on maybe four or five projects. It also enables multiple disciplines to build on projects over time. And a, long, a longer partnership actually like deepens the partnership relationships and it creates a stronger partnership. It also adds resiliency and diversity for the program especially if one partner is unable to participate one semester, as I mentioned before, but it also adds quite a bit of complexity. It's a dynamic puzzle with many interacting pieces. Yeah, Marie, I'm gonna step in and ask you yeah. about that complexity because we have more programs in the network who are going and doing multi-year partnerships for exactly those reasons. They're yeah. seeing the local governments as being, uh, or their local partners being at low capacity, but still wanting that scale just over a, a larger period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, uh, in a short answer, how do you keep track of all of the complexity in that puzzle? How do you put it, yeah, how are you sitting down and putting it together? That's a good question. I, um, this is actually potentially my favorite part of it all. I love the dynamic moving landscape and the different how to um, kind of arrange and integrate the different goals that partners have um, over the entire landscape of courses and um, timing across the semester or across the academic year as well to create the most like mutually beneficial arrangement. It's kind of, it's, it's a fun, it's a, it's like a game. <laughs> it's, um, but how do I actually keep track? I mean, I, I draw things out on paper Mm -hmm. quite a bit actually and then I also have a spreadsheet where I keep track of who will have what and when and just to be sure that things are balanced and that I know um, come ahead of time what the capacity of the partner will be in the coming semester or the coming year so I it also involves lots of conversations with partners and just maintaining and continuing to build deeper relationships to understand their capacity and opportunities and constraints and timelines and underlying <laughs> and overarching goals so Longer answer than you probably wanted, but that's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, so with these multi-year and overlapping partnerships, there are some other operational parts of um, the Epic N model or some ways that a lot of Epic N programs function that we've adapted to adapt to this multi um, multi-year overlapping partnership model. So SCP does not have a request for proposals. Partnerships are developed through conversation. So I meet with potential partners um, and talk through the, what the partnership is all about and their own capacity and their goals and how it could all work out. Um, and it, this has been a, for us a good way to do it because um, thankfully since the, for the pilot program in spring 2016, I have not had to recruit partners. Partners have come to me by referral from their colleagues um, or from hearing about us on a podcast or website, something like that. So it's been, that's, I've been really thankful and encouraged by that. Um, but at the same time, I still have a single point of contact with each partnering organization. There's a partnership lead at each partner or partnering organization, and this is crucial. And this is one of the, the most, <laughs> I think most simple, but most amazing parts of the Epic and model, that there is one point of, one partnership champion at the city or the government agency that you're working with. 
There may be others that lead projects, but that you have one person who is the core partnership liaison and champion. Um, the partnerships still have mutual investment and benefit for the partner and university, and we still have a formal contract that we sign with our partners that outlines the time frame. So they can choose one, two, or three years, and then we can renew it after three years if they chose three and want more. Um, but usually we wrap up at three and give them some time to implement all the things that students have worked on with them. Um, usually partners choose two or three years. We don't have a final wrap-up event at the partner site since we have multiple partners, um, but I developed alternative ways to share the projects, uh, including project films and poster displays in our library and other places on campus and open houses for faculty, students, and partners to meet and learn about projects and what's happening. So again, we have the luxury of not charging partners and this would have added a lot more complexity and would need, I think, more staff time to figure out how to do that based on these really small, some of the projects are pretty small um, and over these uh, time frames. Um, so we work, also work hard to keep costs down and run on a pretty small budget. So we also forgo certain things like larger events at the city, at the partner site and, and opt for kind of smaller, more informal events where people can drop in, but still try to really cultivate the relationships and build the community between uh, partners and students and faculty. We don't have like printing costs. We try to do everything online and all of that. So those are just a few ways we try to keep the costs down so we can run the uh, program on a small budget. And this uh, is just to show you how the multi-year and overlapping partnerships look over time to give you a sense of the number of partners at any given point in time and the variable length of partnerships. Um, so you can see that partners, um, some partners uh, partner just only for a year, but most partner for longer than that. And I always try to kind of um, balance it out. We also have campus partnerships, which I did not include on this, graph so that adds a few more partners to the to the list so there's usually about five or six partners at any given point in time and as i mentioned earlier okay so sorry the second adaptation is scaling to undergraduate courses so as i mentioned earlier st thomas um, is a liberal arts college or university it has um, the programs that we work with are primarily undergraduate students. And that's a different context than a research university who's working with a lot of graduate students. Um, St. Thomas had participated in City Labs, as I mentioned before, which is an epic and program that had closed, unfortunately. But I was able to talk with the course instructors who participated in City Labs to inform the design of faculty engagement with SCP, like what would work for their undergraduate classes. I also uh, myself had integrated two City Labs projects into my own environmental studies courses. So I had firsthand experience to draw from as well. In the design and building of a new program, I highly, highly recommend talking with faculty across disciplines to discuss benefits and barriers to applied learning in their courses, especially at the undergraduate level. It's important to talk with faculty that are from different departments as they may face unique barriers or they may benefit from the partnership in different ways across different departments. The design of faculty engagement um, should always strive to reduce the barriers and increase the benefits to participation and understanding these, um, we're talking with faculty across different disciplines and departments is, is the way to understand this. Um, at St. Thomas, here are the, some of the ways that we've reduced barriers to participation. One is a wide range of project scales. So projects can be a single assignment to a semester long project. And this enables more courses across disciplines to participate even in small ways that still benefit students and the partner. This lets introductory courses participate, which is a great for students to have that experience right away when they first start college. The project sc scoping process, I think, becomes even more incredibly important. It's always very important, but in this um, realm, you we adapt project topics to undergraduate course opportunities and constraints. This is a collaborative process with a partner and faculty member that significantly develops and shapes the project. 
So it shapes it and molds it to the course while still advancing the partner's overarching goal. Very rarely do I have a partner come with a very well-defined project. They come with a goal or a topic and we discuss together how this could be integrated into an undergraduate course. The project scoping process also sets mutual expectations for faculty and partners and provides a clear guide for the project. So it's just so important the Epic and model emphasizes this too, just mutual expectations, shared expectations, managing expectations um, is a crucial part of this. And I facilitate this project scoping, scoping process and write the project scope uh, with, and then uh, faculty and partners can add their input as well, but to further reduce the barrier um, for time in that uh, endeavor. So through this process, the faculty partner and I ensure that the project, and these are the key things that the project scoping process does. Um, it enriches, the project enriches courses existing learning objectives through real world application of course content. It's at a level and scale appropriate to the course and its time constraints. It's logistically feasible, that is, they'll have the data and time that they need, they'll have access to sites and all of that. And then of course that it advances the partner's sustainability goals. Another thing we do is we do not have a standard final report or poster session. I found this was actually a large barrier to faculty participation in undergraduate courses, especially introductory or intermediate level courses where having a large um, uh, final report or a poster session is actually beyond the capacity of the students at that point in time in their education. So partners instead receive the deliverable defined in the project scope and they receive that at the end of the semester and then everybody's done. Just a quick question, yeah. um, back to one of the undergraduate examples, the single mm -hmm. assignment examples. Yeah. I think we have, we would have a lot of questions from the audience about mm -hmm. what is the actual need at that local government or that community that was fulfilled by a single assignment? Do you have just one off the top of your head you could share? Uh, sure, so one of them was a, the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization was really interested in how um, their icons that they were developing for uh, communicating about water quality or um, understood by people. And so an environmental communication class did a small project, one assignment on simply doing focus groups with each other uh -huh. about how they understood those icons. And that feedback that they got through that, it, I think it was about a week of class or one class time um, and then some additional work by students to write up their report but it was a small pretty small single assignment in the the realm of the whole the scope of the whole course mm -hmm. uh, it really helped the um, actually really helped the Mississippi watershed management organization just to have some initial themes to start with to think through um, how people understood the icons and they that then fed into a bigger survey project with them to um, gotcha. uh, understand what the broader population was thinking and to improve their icons. Cool, that's yeah. really, really cool. I'm so glad you were able to have that example to talk <laughs> of mine. Thank you for, <laughs> uh, and I'll let you continue. <laughs> all right. Um, so with all of those adaptations and kind of uh, modifying things in certain ways, the key parts are still there. The, the key tenets of the Epic and model are, and that is that the project topics and goals are identified by the partner in their multidisciplinary projects. And then the students are generating the solutions by applying course content to those project topics. Also, uh, another thing we did to scale to undergraduate courses um, is formative assessment through an SCP student survey to learn what undergrad students need for a better experience. So one outcome of this, um, SCP survey is that we learned after the first semester that students need to have a lot more guidance about what to expect in a real world project. This guide that we developed introduces students to the unique nature of the SCP project experience, that it's much different than a hypothetical or textbook problem, and the guide shares tips to navigate the complexity and ambiguity of real world problems. Of incomplete data. Students really want data that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, so this prepares them that that's going to happen. And also real life changes, the changes in the life of city staff that they're working with. This is often the first time students have experienced this complex learning environment. So we found this was really important to kind of scale this to the undergraduate experience. 
Um, so the multi-year overlapping partnership model and the wide range of project scales and um, the adaptation to the opportunities and constraints of courses across disciplines. So I just want to emphasize that it still retained the positive impacts of the Epic N model for faculty, partners, and students. And here are a few quotes that emphasize that um, just the applied learning, enhancing learning, community beyond the classroom, networking, public speaking, broad-based problem-solving skills. Also, the role of the EPIC and programs um, to facilitate engaging and exciting projects that are easy to integrate into courses. So faculty really appreciate that. And also, the role of a coach rather than a judge was something that I've heard as well. And then from partners, the same thing that they um, the experiences from partnership about the value of SCP projects and student work to partners, that it has, it, it has a positive impact. Um, it bridges research gaps in innovative ways and it helps partners achieve goals that they um, wouldn't have been able to achieve otherwise. So even though we've scaled it differently, over the long-term multi-year partnership, smaller projects can add up to this large impact. And it's been really exciting. Um, and then finally from students, they really value this real world <laughs> ambiguity and complexity, even though it's hard at first, but for some it's an eye opening experience and they love working with real life people. Um, where things actually make an impact uh, they're working with real problems. They also appreciate the career advice and networking and the experience that helps them actually get a job in the future. So uh, it's been exciting to see the various ways it's impacted students all along the lines of the goals of the whole epic and um, model. Another adaptation, um, I'm just going to talk about this one really, really briefly, is of SCP has been to partner with campus initiatives. So we partnered with the Pollinator Path on campus, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, facilities and campus sustainability. So expanding partnership beyond, like, or bringing partnership home <laughs> to our own campus. And then the last adaptation that I want to talk about is a way to engage community with the projects. So EPIC and programs and SCP, they have great, amazing benefits for students and partners um, in advancing goals and applied learning and problem solving. But residents of the partner communities often don't have the opportunity to directly engage with the project findings. And this is one thing that I really wanted to figure out a way to <laughs> engage residents. So to bridge this gap, um, inspired by efforts that connect art and sustainability, I developed an art-based initiative to engage the community with project findings through collaboration with local artists. And also in the Twin Cities, again, uh, touching, circling back to the context of the community, the Twin Cities area has a strong and vibrant arts community. So this has actually been a, a really uh, exciting thing that has connected with lots of different, with the community in different ways than I even expected. So here is how it works. I call it SCP Arts. Um, and it's the, again, the final adaptation I will talk about today. <laughs> and SCP Arts uh, seeks to engage residents of partner communities with SCP project findings through art. The way this works is that students collaborate with a local artist to translate their SCP project findings into artwork. So the artist comes to class and does workshops to talk with students about their project findings and how these could could be communicated through art. And together, the artists and students develop the concepts for the artwork, but the artist actually does all the drawing. <laughs> Although we have discovered some students are really amazing artists in this process. So this interaction of research and art also enriches students' analysis and communication of project findings as they think about their work differently. And SCP and partners share the artwork in their communities and beyond bringing to life their sustainability goals for people of all ages. And these, these include public art installation, exhibitions, and informal ways as well. And just to give you a quick example, here is an SCP Arts project with Metro Transit. One of, Metro Transit is one of our partners. They're the transit agency in the Twin Cities area. And one of their goals is to understand and communicate the importance of public transit to the community. Kelly Morrell with Metro Transit Transit collaborated with Leadership for Social Justice students to explore uh, the diverse stories of transit riders and the importance of transit in their lives through interviews, community-based research. Students worked with our artist and resident Sarah Nelson to translate the connecting themes of their research into artwork. 
and students identified the theme of transformation and transit riders' stories um, and developed the visual metaphor of the monarch butterfly's life cycle to communicate this theme. And they wrote a book, and that's the cover of their book with Sarah's artwork. You see students thinking about different visual representations in the picture um, on the bottom left, and uh, Sarah, that's Sarah, <laughs> working with the class to think through different visual metaphors there. And then to engage the community, the illustrations became the exterior wrap of a light rail train car in the 20, Twin Cities during Earthly, Earth Week last year and throughout the summer. And the interior was also fully illustrated um, by Sarah to express the interdependent relationship between nature, sustainability, community, and of course, public transportation. And I'm not sure if you can see it, um, but public transportation is connecting these various scenes throughout the seasons in the Twin Cities with um, very uh, important Twin Cities area spaces being highlighted. And I wanted to say special thanks to Metro Transit and the College of Arts and Sciences at St. Thomas for funding the train route. So, SCP Arts has also collaborated with, collaborated with the St. Thomas Pollinator Path. And this is the last example. It's a, the Pollinator Path is a series of on-campus gardens. It's a living lab where students and faculty and staff and visitors can really observe pollinators and understand their activity and their habitat and how to support pollinator populations. SCP um, collaborations seek to enrich the ecological and educational value. Uh, here are courses we've collaborated with. Um, and doing an art space project with the Pioneer Path seemed like a really uh, amazing opportunity, so we did. S students in biology courses worked with our SCP artists in residence, Sarah again, to create activities to engage kids and also adults with the Pioneer Path. You can see some of the activities they developed with Sarah's illustrations, and there they are in their lab, um, working, learning about parts of a flower that they included in the activity guide. Um, so kids can use and adults can use these activities to explore the pollinator path, but also their own neighborhood. It can be used anywhere. We had an exhibit at the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization with a community event and adults and um, kids explored the MWMO's native plantings using the pollinator pathways activity guides. And we've also collaborated with the Department of Art History on an exhibit in their campus gallery space, highlighting the work with the Pioneer Path and other SCP arts projects, including one with the Mississippi Watershed and Management Organization on exploring people's experiences of the Mississippi River. So the goal of this SCP arts uh, initiative is to engage again, people of all ages with communities, sustainability goals to bring project findings to life, including kids, who are naturally drawn to art. And this is a picture I had to include of my son painting his first mural. He was also the one holding up the bingo card in the community event <laughs> slide too. So in closing, I um, just wanna summarize the key ad adaptations of Disgust based on the university and community context of St. Thomas were multi-year overlapping partnerships to reduce barriers to participation for partners and faculty and enhance interdisciplinary inquiry. Also scaling to undergraduate courses. So there is a wide range of project scales from single assignments to semester long projects and the importance of project scoping and the adaptation of these projects to course constraints and opportunities. Um, collaboration with campus initiatives and then finally SCP arts to engage communities and to bring to life partners sustainability goals for people of all ages. So as um, I conclude, I uh, want to leave, a couple, leave you with a few final thoughts. So your university may have similar, a similar context or a very different context. So the answers to these questions that I started out with in the presentation may be really different than the ones that I shared with you in the case study of SCP's founding and uh, development and program design, um, but they can help inform how you can adapt the EPIC and model to make it work so that it can work well for your university. And then also, of course, the landscape of your community as well, asking these questions of potential partners and understanding what kinds of partnerships would be beneficial and the types of sustainability challenges that your, the, your communities are facing that your university could address. 
I'll just say, for example, our university does not have an architecture program, so we could not address questions that needed architecture. <laughs> so that's, a, that's another way to kind of align what you have to offer and what the community needs. So I hope thinking through these overarching questions about the landscape of your university and your community and talking with people in your community and on your campus as you design your program is helpful. And the overarching question is simply how to implement the EPIC and model so that it works at and benefits your institution and your community. And I'm sorry, I can't be there kind of virtually in person <laughs> for actual questions, but please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or would like to discuss strategies specific to your context. And I would be happy to talk with you. And thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. On behalf of uh, the entire EPIC network, I will thank you. And we will have um, many people, I'm sure, reach out to you with questions as, as that was very meaningful content. Uh, and we really want everyone else to, that's watching this to continue the discussion offline uh, or on social media. You can give EPIC N feedback, uh, so that way, and we can pass it along to Maria if you'd like. You can use our social media hashtag 2020 EPIC N uh, and highlight uh, both uh, their channels on Facebook and Twitter. You can, you'll be emailed a link to this session if you attend the live recording tomorrow or if you send me an email. Uh, you can also find it on our events page and along with all of our other events from Epic N where uh, Maria's uh, highlighted every once in a while as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to open up to just question and answer with me <laughs> and Maria just for a couple of seconds to get some answers to questions I think I know our programs are going to want to ask uh, based on um, some things. Uh, but for those of you who have dropped or are going to drop off if you for the Q&A, thank you so much for attending. And uh, we hope you participate in some of other um, of the webinar series. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop my sh screen. So it's just Maria and I talking. And uh, I'm going to start with a question that is the easy, the easier one. Uh, just yes or no. Uh, while scuba diving, because you like to scuba dive, uh, have you had any epiphanies for your EPIC program? Just yes or no? I'll say no. Ah, okay. But only because it's, I'm, perhaps I had epiphanies in advance of, I feel, ah. I do feel like scuba diving helps you under, like, experience interconnections, and that's what these kinds of programs are all about, so. We'll and looking we'll at say. things in different dimensions, <laughs> moving all around. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be dark and like mm -hmm. just having to observe things differently is probably, Beautiful. anyway, I <laughs> leave you to be the person that knows about it. Uh, next question, uh, a little bit more specific. Uh, we are going to have some folks who are representing small colleges or mm -hmm. liberal arts colleges or universities watching this, and they're going to want to ask you, uh, that's great. How do I get my liberal arts school on board? And I like to think about it in terms of the three different, I also attended a liberal arts school, 1500 undergrad. Uh, and so I, I feel like I understand the context a little bit, having spoken with a lot of people in many of the different fields. And I usually think there's three, admin, faculty, and uh, class or like your you don't your your um staff uh staff right i'm in faculty student activities student groups students <laughs> students oi, oi, oi. so how would you what would be your first step that you would give when they ask you how do i do it on my campus for students one for faculty and one for administration hmm. okay so i think for all, I'll kind of go in the opposite order, maybe. For administration, I think it's a lot of what I talked about at the beginning. How can you, um, mm -hmm. where is the, what are the goals and priorities of the university and how does the EPIC N model enhance and enrich those? So don't try to, you're not trying to change what the university is doing. You're trying to show that this, the EPIC N model can help them do it even better and it can. So that's, and you have, there's lots of examples to share as well. I think for us having um, the opportunity to show the administration what the Epic and network was doing and other programs were doing was really powerful in um, 
uh, having them approve our internal grant proposal, uh, funding the pilot, and then uh, deciding we would be a permanent program shortly after that. So, cool. and then for faculty, I think it's especially at a liberal arts college, the focus is really on the student teacher relationship and how guiding students through the their intellectual development and curiosity and inquiry learning is um, such a powerful way to do that as well. Experiential applied research and problem solving, um, especially also connecting across disciplines. And those are the things that the ethic and model um, really brings to the, the kind of the, the surface, the forefront. It provides, it creates the opportunities for those multidisciplinary engaged applied learning experiences. And for faculty who love teaching, seeing students experience that and go through the process of problem solving in the context of real questions, applying what they're learning in class to those real questions and seeing their transformation, like transformational learning, um, really, I think, at least as a, you know, when I teach, I love to see that um, happen. And these projects just really uh, create those opportunities for that to happen. And then finally for students, um, you know, students, Again, you gotta, you, it's very important to help them understand the, the kind of experience they're gonna have, that it'll be, amb it'll be um, ambiguous and they're gonna navigate a lot of uncertainty and complexity that they never have before. But if you set that out and they understand that you understand that that's gonna happen and that's okay, then their experiences are really good and they, they learn through like, problem solving in a different way. They get career advice. They make relationships in the community. They can talk about it on, in their job interview and help really students at St. Thomas get jobs that they're interested in. Um, it just brings to life what they're learning. Um, and it definitely does require more work for students, but a lot of students really appreciate that um, ability or that opportunity again to apply what they're learning and to see what kinds of mm -hmm. differences it can make in the community. And it's mm -hmm. good practice for them because once they graduate, <laughs> students will, it's a safe, it's a safe place to practice with a community guide, a partner guide and your mm -hmm. faculty as a guide to mm -hmm. navigate all of that complexity. Yeah, but we even have programs who will build in the redundancy and you might do this too, where they'll, or I've heard stories of other programs where they'll, make it even lower risk by having more than one student on the same yeah. project, but to do it differently. So that way the yeah. community partner gets both. You do that as well? Yeah, that we do. Uh, it depends on the project, but we do that with quite a few projects, especially especially with larger classes. The first project or first semester is spring with a city of 2016 with the city of Delano. Two economics classes collaborated together on a project. So there were like 60 oh, wow. students. And the instructors broke them into groups so that there were students from the different classes in each group. And they worked on different, analyzing energy efficiency of three different types of public infrastructure, city hall, street lights, fire station. Actually, there was four. There was a heritage center as well. Um, cool. But there was redundancy within each of those groups. Like, so there were multiple groups of students working on each building. And so, yeah, it took off. It both makes it, less um, stressful, I think, because you don't think that, you know, the partner's going to only have what you have in case it's difficult or, but it, and it also adds in this like fun sense of competition too, like a good competition. So there yep. are definitely really the, the benefits for that kind of design of the pr project. Yeah, no, I totally, and I see it now even virtually, um, we have some examples of programs who are doing it, doing that kind of redundancy or work virtually and it's creating better products than they were doing normally mm -hmm. because they've like just kind of tweaked things the right way and it's like oh this clicks yeah. so <laughs> intriguing um so my uh, last question mm -hmm. uh is or second to last sorry what two two questions more first is where you mentioned university context and community context and being it's really important to understand them mm -hmm. i think sometimes it's hard to know where to go to find that information especially communities uh, where you're, and you're working with multiple communities in our small campuses and our liberal arts campuses. Again, they're not gonna be looking at the traditional, uh, you know, big city center with a very public website that says, here's our comprehensive plan. Here's how we find it. 
if they're looking for non-traditional partners or nonprofits or smaller governments or unincorporated governments, where would you direct them? Like where were the two or three places you would direct them to, to start finding those information points? That's a good question. I think um, it's easier for us because there's a program in Minnesota called Green Step Cities. That is a voluntary program um, run in part by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, I think. Um, but uh, they have different steps of sustainability goals that cities can meet. So they can get like be step one, step two, step three, step four. So it's a voluntary program to try to increase your city's sustainability um, and they mm -hmm. get resources and things from that. So there's about 80, I probably have that number, that number's not quite right, but about 80 cities in, the, uh, in Minnesota that are participating and they range in uh -huh. size. So that was one good way, we sent out an email to all of those cities to see if we got one only one reply but that was elk river so that was great it started off our our program um so the, i guess the the broader general generalization of that uh statement is just that are there networks of, among uh -huh. smaller cities uh -huh. within and, your state that you could you could draw from like a coalition of cities or or mm -hmm. that kind of thing um it's also worth just like working through your own networks who you may know from past professional mm -hmm. uh, engagements. Like I started with some, an organization that I had worked with um, just being an instructor for one of their community uh, learning events. And they were mm -hmm. really helpful because they were really well connected. So oh. you get, you connect with one partner and they connect you with another and they connect you with another. And they, so you really just, it's like a thread, like start, just start. There's the epic ends. <laughs> you gotta bring, you gotta bring it I in. Everybody I does. Need to do that, but it's see, it's true. So, like, you just start with one person, and then you follow the thread, and you, you find other connections and learn more about yeah. the landscape. It's it's a it's kind of an exploratory process, and people yeah. are really helpful and really interested if you're really interested. So my my final question is just given the context of COVID nineteen. Um, what other than your advice of like what you presented on. Mm -hmm. um, looking out to our network you know many of them and um they know you and we got some newcomers a lot of newcomers because it's a free webinar series and uh, we're opening things up to try and make it easier for people to use our resources but what would be your like one line of advice to those folks because you're kind of you know you're five more years in just in some of it and also um yeah just what's your advice oh that's good um facing this i thing. think that so one project, these kinds of projects can take really different, many different forms. The one form of the project that isn't able to happen right now is a lot of direct interaction with people because of all of the um, social distancing and uh, universities going online and all of that. So one piece of advice that I would have if you're planning on starting a program within this current context of potential social distancing or online learning is to, as you create, as you talk with partners and develop projects, you think about how they can happen all online. Is these, the beautiful thing about these projects is they can, they're really powerful in person and when students are in the field, but they can also, there's so many questions that cities have and so many questions that partners have that you can, that can be answered without that direct interaction as well. So planning proactively for that is, I think at this point in time is really important. That's what I'm trying to do for fall projects. <laughs> so they can all be done online if necessary, but they don't have to be, but they could be. So thinking through like when you talk with cities or potential partners, like what are, what are some data sets that you really want to analyze that you just haven't gotten to or some exploratory questions, research that mm -hmm. students could do or something on the horizon that you want more information about or designing something based on information you already have that could happen online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's endless possibilities it's so exciting <laughs> well thank you so much i really appreciate your time again um i um i agree yeah i just a pleasure listening to you talk about your program and how you got it to where it is today i hope our other folks who are attending and watching today will be able to take some stuff home with them and start applying it to help the communities in the response and recovery to COVID as well as all the other problems or or things that their local communities are trying to face but Thank you again and have a, a wonderful evening.